So, on behalf of Beyond Law CLC, we welcome you on the board. Everybody, you need no further introduction. Everybody knows you as such as an ASG as well as a senior advocate appearing for and on behalf of the state as well as for the other parties. The word, when you appear impossible, only becomes I am possible. Your appearing leaves an indelible mark and it's always a treat to meet you outside the court and inside the court is it's always once you make submissions it's just like music to the ears you feel just we have to keep on listening to you whatever way that you argue it's always a treat for the ears etc so i ask you to just take over the session just for everybody before you take off uh, the question answer sessions have to be put in the chat box sir would uh, give a session for around 40 to 50 minutes and those will be answered uh, this thing and the persons who have not shown the name, displayed the names on the screen, their questions will not be asked to, sir. Thank you, sir. And it will last till uh, 6.30, uh, 7.30. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. I'm going to speak about a favorite topic of mine, which is criminal investigations and handling criminal investigations. The, you know, if you looked at, spoke to the traditional criminal lawyers and you asked them, you went to them at the investigation stage. Most traditional lawyers would say, you want to ask us, want us to apply for bail? Are you being arrested? They were not really concerned with investigations because the original view used to be, that's something which the police have to deal with. Juniors would be sent to appear at remands. If bail needed to be sought, bail would be sought. And that era, that class of lawyers, thought that the their role during investigation was really not, did not, there was no lawyer's role during investigation, so to speak. Today, we have, things have changed. We no longer have that traditional policing and no longer, no longer are we limited to the traditional hurt crimes, which are murders, etc., bodily crimes. The vast majority of crimes is economic, socio-economic crime. And therefore, we have to deal with investigating agencies, not just the state police, but specialized investigating agencies, centralized agencies like the CBI, the NIA, the Enforcement Directorate, the DRI, the Customs Authorities, the Excise Authorities, as also, uh, but, you know, as I said, CBI. And, this, and apart from that, you also have agencies as new and specialized as the SFIO, the Serious Fraud Investigation Office, which deals with Companies Act prosecutions. Now, these all agencies have different styles, different mechanisms. Some, like the CBI and the State Police, will follow the CRPC. Others have their own fascinating procedures where they don't really follow the CRPC. And this challenge is currently pending again in the Supreme Court. This is the third round of challenge, whether they are bound by the CRPC, whether they have to register FIRs or, or not. There are also cases where you have in special investigation teams which are instituted. So these are created either by orders of a court or by the department itself. For example, in certain heinous crime, crimes that catch the imagination of society, Governments often resort to having special investigation teams and perhaps it is felt that NSIT adds something in terms of the expertise, uh, the large number of, uh, the, the, the large number of support uh, in, and infrastructure that they have so that investigations are a little faster and more efficacious. Now, in all of this, we have to see how are we going to deal with it? from the point where the complaint is filed, because these days, as you know, in terms of Lalita Kumari, there is an inquiry even prior, the, prior to the complaint. And at that stage, notices are issued, though these are issued in terms of, at least for North India, they're issued in terms of the Punjab police rules. The procedure for inquiry is under the Punjab police rules. But this procedure has been recognized in terms of the Lalita Kumari decision, though a time limit has been placed. Then you have the registration of the FIR. At this stage, the accused has no role. The sending to the court, again, the accused has no role, 157. And then you have examination of witnesses under Section 161, Section 91, summoning of documents, confessions, 
before magistrates, examination of crime scenes, inquests, forensic examination, postmortem, etc., and medical examination of accused persons, victims, arrest, and then arrest. During this entire exercise, it is becoming increasingly essential that a party and his lawyer, if necessary, engage with the enforcement of the investigating agency. A lackadaisical approach at this point can be a very expensive proposition in the long run because it can be the difference between ensuring your defense and exculpatory material material which would ensure that you ought not to be charged because of the chalan and material which shows your from the 1960s in Badilal Panchal it was held and that's a judgment which is off not considered so you would have to check it on your side the audibility is slightly low now okay I'll just check I'll yeah, it's, perfect. it's perfect it's perfect now Okay, no, I think sometimes what happens is, is this better? Yeah, perfect, perfect. So which is the part you have missed out, if I may ask? Uh, so last two lines. Okay, so what I was saying was that, you know, you have to, and I'll come back to this issue of engaging with enforcement agencies. So the, the concern today is, you, if you don't engage with enforcement agencies, you may run into a situation where it's a very expensive proposition that you end up, that is, you will end up facing a prosecution. Mr. Amit Verma says he can't hear me. Can the others not hear me? Can you just clarify because I'm not very... Uh, at sure. least uh, everybody else is... Okay, Mr. Verma, you'll, you'll have to figure out something. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am a little soft. I can't help it. That's my nature. But I'll try and be as audible as possible. As I said, and I'm going to come back and repeat this for the third time so that nobody misses this out. Engagement with enforcement and investigating agencies is a very crucial step in handling of an investigation. The first step is for a client to reach the appropriate person to get legal advice. And here, while this is meant for clients, I also say this to my friends who are on this, that a lot of us are practitioners in separate fields. So I may be a practitioner, let's say, in the general criminal law, but there's a specialized prosecution where you have, a, let's say, an income tax prosecution. It is not enough for a traditional criminal lawyer to deal with it. It is time to sometimes collaborate and confer with chartered accountants, with taxation lawyers, to understand what kind of defense can be put up in such investigations. Similarly, for the Companies Act, because there are statutory filings and a person who's a company's lawyer who understands the filings, the requirements of company's law, the procedural requirements, that's the kind of professional you need who has to synthesize with a criminal lawyer so that the client can get the best possible advice. And at this stage, if we start shooting from the hip, there's going to be trouble for the client and even for the lawyer, perhaps at some stage where he's going to be questioned as to his capability and his effective uh, uh, response to the client's needs. Engagement with inf investigating agencies begins very much at the initial stage because what happens is you are asked for documents, you are asked to give statements, and at this stage it becomes very crucial what is the kind of advice that a client is going to be given, how is the client going to deal with this in terms of supply of documents, in terms of... Uh, you know, even giving the statements. We all recall the old judgment of Nandini Satpati. I believe you would have seen that wonderful decision of Nandini Satpati. It's 1978 to SCC 424 that a lawyer has a right, a client has a right to have a lawyer present during entire interrogation. And that is a very important decision. The lawyer has to be in sight, but not hearing. As young lawyers, I remember when we were fresh at the bar, Nandini Satpati's judgment was a favorite because when we didn't have much work, one of the opportunities we got was to hang around outside the lockup or outside the CBI office, do a 12 hour shift and earn some petty change at the end of the day. And that was a great boon for people like who didn't have so much work. The citation is Nandini Satpati 1978 decision, 1978. 
68, volume 2, SC 424. Unfortunately, when we came up with DK Basu, the Supreme Court decided to dilute this. Now, this often happens. The court was concerned with a letter petition, and the reason the court was concerned was because they believed that while there were lots of safeguards in the CRPC, people accused were not getting their rights and therefore they wanted to create a remedy for enforcement of such rights. So they said, if such rights are breached, an accused person can seek ensued contempt proceedings, there can be departmental proceedings against officers. And these requirements of DK Basu apply throughout the country. They are requirements during investigation. But there's a problem here. D.K. Basu also dilutes Nandini Satpati and said, an accused is entitled to access to lawyer to a lawyer during investigation, but only part of it is not he or she is not entitled to a lawyer's presence throughout the investigation. It's only to confer, which really dilutes the D.K. Basu principle. And this has now been incorporated in the CRPC in Section 41D, which is a matter of some concern. But as I said, that's a development in the law. We may not, we have to live with it and we have to deal with it. And that provision gets challenged and quashed or otherwise diluted. Now, engagement with enforcement agencies also means that when you get a summons to supply documents, you must advise your client that there must be scrutinizing of the documents or the material. Why is this important? This is important because sometimes, let's say in a commercial fraud case, there are a number of drafts in the final contract is signed and there are ups and downs in the initial drafts which are not agreed to. Now, what is relevant is the final document because there is going to be a consideration, a debate, a deliberation. And you can't go by earlier drafts, so they may have built up to that. In a converse situation, if a question arises whether a document is antedated or not, you can show prior existing drafts which have perhaps been exchanged on email or other correspondence which show that there has been a working up to cre creation of a document and therefore the document is contemporaneous in the time that it was signed and is not an antedated document. So documents must be produced after due analysis. And when required, we must seek time from investigators to produce documents and records. And also, this just doesn't apply to documents. This also applies to material objects. So, of course, material objects are taken up in search and seizure more often than not. Now, at this stage, it is also important to ensure that documents which are exculpatory. So, let's say I am in Delhi. Mr. Chatrath is in Chandigarh. Mr. Chatrath raises an objection that on a certain day, he and I had a disagreement and I have assaulted him. I produced from Delhi my credit card slip at the contemporaneous time showing that I was in Delhi at the time. Or I produce and a court order to say that I was attending court arguing a matter at the very time, although these days, as you know, court or hearings are only online, so I could very well be doing it in Chandigarh. But that kind of situation becomes important that you can show an alibi and you can show presence elsewhere. And if this exculpatory record is not put forward at the initial stage of the investigation, then we'll definitely have an issue. The fact is, police often do not give acknowledgements. When they seize documents, they prepare a cursory seizure memo, but we must try and give them a list of documents which are seized. And if they are asking for documents in terms of section 91, and there's a summons to produce documents, please prepare a comprehensive list of documents, especially in documentary evidence cases. Sometimes there are voluminous files. Let's say you give 100 files with, uh, let's say, about 100 pages each. So that's 10,000 pages. In the transmission and the handing over, material documents may get lost, destroyed, or may not be considered. If you've given the police a comprehensive list, if you had the time to give them a comprehensive list of that documents, you have the advantage that when this matter comes to trial, you will be able to seek those documents seized but not relied upon. Now, how can that be done? That can be done by virtue of a judgment called Nityanand. I happen to be a micro in that. You may want to see that. It was a case of supply of documents. And I believe it was Justice Adash Koyal and Justice Dalit who took a view 
that exculpatory documents or documents which are relevant to the accused seized but not produced by the investigating officer can even be summoned at the stage of charge which is a great change from the position in devendranath padi because that only said that you can only produce this material at in a quashment petition and they cannot be relied upon at the stage of discharge and it's a decision which you may want to look up all of you uh, also there is another problem that arises let's say clients are facing an investigation especially commercial clients there is always a flurry of electronic communications whether it be emails whether it be whatsapp whether it be messages whether it be voice calls today one of the most telling way to prosecute people and gather evidence is to obtain their phones which will indicate the post incident post crime conversations post crime creation of records and that becomes an indicator for an investigator as to what's happened in the past so even between lawyers and litigants please remember lawyers lawyers communication may be privileged but it's privileged in so far as the accused allows it not to be privileged if the phone is seized and in the custody of the uh, prosecution they will know exactly the defense that has been built up during investigation so we must be very careful about generation of electronic evidence against us even during an investigation and therefore correspondence over emails and text messages must be minimal even between professional and litigant and sometimes these are misconstrued as a result of which even lawyers have been pushed to search and seizure by some of the more gungo agencies such as uh, some of the more gungo agencies i don't want to necessarily name them today all of this entails a level of cooperation so you must cooperate during investigation especially state police has a tendency to arrest but a lot of the other agencies central agencies and others don't always arrest during investigation therefore a balanced cooperation is important but this cooperation must not be a dilution of your rights under article 20 you must be not be in a position where you are going to go there and confess and therefore while you are there you must cooperate and ensure that the cooperation is such that you can hopefully avoid arrest from such agencies but keep it in mind arrest is not necessarily completely avoidable it's a discretion of the police officer so if there is an apprehension the client must be advised if feasible to apply for anticipatory bail at the appropriate stage so to not do that would also be inappropriate because there are cases where the investigating agency are going to arrest despite what we believe is cooperation in investigation this cooperation as i said will not be a cooperation of self incrimination but we must balance the two issues so when you are called when a client is called to an investigating agency we must also advise them a don't give opinions b don't talk about things which you have heard from third parties after all hearsay evidence is not admissible even in court three do not admit facts which you don't have personal knowledge of and d answer as briefly as possible because every answer will lead to three more questions possibly verbosity is something which is almost fatal to a person joining investigation and that is what must be avoided if you are apprehending that you are going to be treated as an accused even if not initially at a later stage guesswork must be avoided very often you know you have people who will go and they'll be asked, they'll be shown documents or material evidence and be asked to comment on that and they will start interpreting it though they are neither the makers of that record nor they have dealt with it nor they have seen it but because they know the person who is the signatory of it or they know a context about it if that be the situation my suggestion is if you are being shown a, if a witness is being accused or a person is being shown a documentary record which he or she is not the signatory of nor is it addressed to him or her then at the most you can identify the signature or 
if you have knowledge that it was received or it is lying in your office or was sent from your office in the normal course of business, supposing you're the person handling correspondence, that's all you can depose. You are not supposed to give an interpretation of the contents of the documents. Of course, such opportunities in some cases can be used by persons to give an explanation regarding the contents to explain a document so that if the police officer, investigating officer, believes it is incriminating, that is, it leads to a inference of guilt, you can try and dispel that inference of guilt if it is so feasible, but these have to be seen on a case-by-case -case basis. So as I said, these are some of the parameters which I want you also to consider. One of the things that happens more often than not in investigation is uh, accused or individuals are put up with other accused and they are confronted either with the person, him or herself, or confronted with a confessional statement. Clients must be advised that these confessional statements are a very weak piece of evidence. They can't be used without corroboration. They're good enough for investigation and perhaps even for arrest, but otherwise they have no real evidentiary value except certain statutes allow them as admissible. If that be the case, we must be very careful in advising our clients not to get off track merely by the fact that you're confronted with a person who has a different point of view or otherwise because you have a right of, you have A, a right of silence and B, a presumption of innocence. I must also point out that there is, as you all know, a distinction between two sets of investigations. So specialized agencies, when they record statements, those statements are signed and they are admissible in evidence. Whereas when the police or the NIA or the CBI record statements, those are not to be signed. They are 161 CRPC statements not to be signed. And that distinction is very important because a 161 statement is nothing. And especially if it's of an accused, it's nothing. However, a statement before a customs officer, an enforcement director officer or a DRI officer, is very problematic or even an SFIO officer is very problematic because that statement is admissible in evidence and this distinction must be understood and must be noted. There is of course a large body of confusion now caused or, or concern rather I will say caused by the judgment in Ritesh Sinha's case. You know, we had the old case of Selvi. Do you recall Selvi? Selvi was that wonderful judgment which dealt with the issue of uh, certain scientific tests. So, uh, tests such as uh, uh, lie detection tests or brain mapping. These are all investigating tools. And that was the principle of law that was laid down in that decision. We must advise our clients that they're not duty bound to take these tests. If they take them, they are tools for investigation. If they are asked to take them and they have taken them, I am saying they are tools, but nothing more than that. So while they have relevance during investigation, they are nothing more 2010, 4 SCC, 4 scale, 690 is the judgment. So only that information in these tests, which is obtained voluntarily, can be accepted and nothing more and nothing less. As I said, recently we have that decision where the Supreme Court has said that the magistrate has a power to direct a person to give a sample of his or her voice. So these become very important concerns because that mechanism has been evolved judicially. I have certain concerns, though it's a three judges bench case and we are bound by it, but I have certain concerns about this decision because while there is no legislation to do so, this has been done under Article 140 and whether my rights can be curtailed in terms of a 140 direction, because after all, Article 21 talks about procedure established by law. So can a precedent be procedure established by law? That's something which will be debated, I hope, at some future date. But right now, Ritesh Sina is the law and will have to be complied with and an accused can be compelled to give a voice sample. You're, a lot of you are from Punjab and Punjab has a lot of uh, international exposure. So there are a lot of international angles to some investigations that happen and therefore I will deal with mutual legal assistance and let us look at it. Now these uh, concepts are very important because when there are trans-border crimes, mutual legal assistance agreements exist between countries and letters of can be issued 
to summon people or get documents or get material or even get statements recorded. This is a matter of reciprocity and on committee of courts. And it's difficult to enforce such a request without an MLAT being in existence. You remember the old judgment in the Beaufort's case, Win Chadda. They said that evidence can be collected. Now, this material has to be collected and, and statements can also be recorded. And these become important because these can be used in investigation even in India. There is a case presently pending in the Supreme Court, Rahul Sarab's case, which deals with this. And this is important because the, que the question really is, if a crime is committed purely in India, can a foreign country register an investigation and begin and insist that the Indian authorities start cooperating with them? So these jurisdiction issues are still pending in the, are recent, are still pending in the Supreme Court. And hopefully when the lockdown opens, it will be determined and hopefully in favor of the accused, and then you can have the benefit of that. So I'm sure my friends from the prosecution may not agree. The last area which I want to cover today is legal representation during investigation. A lot of what I'm going to tell you, what I've told you today, is I believe not in the textbooks, but it's from years of experience. I would have said I've lost my hair over the last 30 years, but then today I've shaved my head, so the loss of hair really doesn't show up. There is no hair to show. Now, Legal representation, there are now, if I may put it, a few accused in a case or one accused. If there's a sole accused, there's no problem. But even during investigation, sometimes there are multiple accused. In a recent case I'm doing, which is an SFIO prosecution in Delhi, in the trial court, there are 287 accused. Each has its own defense. Especially in the cases of corporations, the directors, the officers may have a distinct defense from others. So wherever in criminal cases, there is a commonality of defense. In the commonality of defense, you can have common counsel. But otherwise on record, especially in conspiracy cases, you should have separate counsel. And I'm not saying this because I want to generate business for my legal brethren. But as a matter of strategy, sometimes there are distinct nuances and distinct points that have to be taken by different counsel. And that becomes very important. The last issue, which I must point out is that while there are distinct counsels that may be kept, very often in a criminal case, you will have to have an integrated legal strategy and that requires a certain amount of cooperation amongst counsel because when people start blaming each other, it is the entire defense that suffers more often than not. I would not want to complete this without touching about B. There is in criminal cases, investigations, you know, there is a lot of pressure on counsels to move bail. There is always this desire of clients who are arrested that we must come out. There is also sometimes a desire to move anticipatory bail. Anticipatory bail is not necessarily to be moved at the first instance if you are in a gray area of not being arrested. And especially with investigating agencies such as the CBI, I would often advise a client to hold on because more likely they will file the charge sheet without arrest. However, things are different with the state police. Things are often different with some of the other specialized agencies. Now, the other agencies, each agency has its own norm. But let's say a person is arrested and bail is to be sought. We often see, by the time these matters reach the Supreme Court, multiple applications for bail have been moved because clients are moving them one after the other. Now, bail also has to be sought strategically. We have to be concerned which are the accused who we can move for first who have a better chance, whether because of personal grounds, medical grounds, uh, you know, grounds such as uh, family grounds or grounds of age, infirmity, gender, or role in the transaction. Now, you must place those first. Once bail starts opening up for one person, the doors will open up for others. But that's a matter of strategy and a matter of judgment call. We can't just do this rashly. We will have to strategize in turn. And with that, I will end today's talk and then leave the floor open for questions. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful session. It's just like though you have disclosed the recipe, but uh, the taste of the food, what you make, will continue to remain the best. I'll just read the few questions. Meanwhile, they can post on the chat box. I'll also have a look at the chat box. 
So you are yourself examining it, or should I read? Exactly. I'll also have a look. Okay, why don't you post the questions? Maybe uh, I, I will do that. I will read the questions. So first question is by Sumit Jain. Is accused person bound by the magistrate order under section 311A for giving specimen of handwriting? If accused refused, can he be charged with any offence? Sorry, come again. I didn't. I didn't catch that. Well, Sumit Jain says, is accused person bound by magistrate order under section 311A for giving specimen of handwriting? If yes. accused refuses, can he be charged with any offence? Uh, just, I believe there is an offence now. Regarding this, I'll just I'll just pull out that offense. There's an offense now for that. For refusal. Uh, just a moment. Give me a minute. That, that's an answer I'll have to give you. Meanwhile, why don't you put the next question to me? Uh, uh, next question is uh, Gagandeep Goyal asked, how far is the rule of presumption of innocence practiced by the investigating agencies and the court today in <laughs> absolute terms? That's a very important question. The presumption of innocence, you see, there is a concept called practical policing. Now, practical policing is the hunch of the investigating officer, which is a little bit of a problem, as you all know. And this hunch of the investigating officer leads to a situation where the investigator, and I'm going to ask the first question in a little while, where an investigator starts uh, believing a set of facts. So there is a lot of movement on suspicion and suspicion alone. The more efficient officers will not move on suspicion alone, but this is the reality of our system. So the presumption of innocence is not only lost before the investigating officer, unfortunately, even at the stage of bail, that is not being given enough credence to, and that's leading to an aberration in our system. There is also a parallel movement, that is to say, in a lot of statutes, Presumption of innocence has been taken away. And very frankly, the media doesn't help matters also. As you see every day, before a case is decided, even at the investigation stage, there are people, including professionals, being for blood of an individual to say that they person must be arrested. The moment you are named in an FIR, arrest must follow. That's not the law. If you remember the 2003 MC Abraham judgment, that was a case where a person was arrested uh, was moved and bail dismissed. The High Court passed observations as to why he or she was not being arrested. And the Supreme Court had to come down heavily and say, the discretion to arrest is that of the police officer. And that is not, that is not to be forced upon by a court. And this is a distinction which we need to understand. I think there is to be a serious relook at the criminal justice system because these aberrations are arising from time to time and they're a matter of some concern. So before we proceed, I will just tell the uh, participants, since we have sufficient questions, first let us complete till three questions are left, then we will ask them to post the questions. Otherwise, the, all the questions will get mixed up. Sure, sure. Yeah. So why don't we have, uh, what is the next question? So, uh, Vinaj Vidyan asked, what is your opinion on, this, uh, on section 124A of the IPC regarding to the crime of sedition? Do you believe sedition should exist as a crime? Look, uh, you're taking away something I'm speaking about tomorrow. <laughs> Pardon? You're, you're making me answer something I'm speaking about tomorrow. Though I must say I spoke about this yesterday to the Madurai Bar also, to the lawyers in Tamil Nadu. I must tell you two parts. I am a special, pro I'm a prosecutor in some cases where I'm actually, uh, where sedition has been applied and I'm prosecuting it. Having said that, my belief is, and this is my personal belief, I'm entitled to have that, that in a democracy, in a country where each one of us is a sovereign, we make up the nation, whether it be people from north, east, west, south, whether it be for people from different castes, communities, religions, we make up this nation. Sedition was an offense which related to times of kings and emperors. That time is past. In a democracy, the right to freedom of speech should be read to take away sedition from the statute book. It's a anachronism which has existed for too long. In the country of its birth, that's England, it came from the statute of Westminster. In the country of its birth, it's been done away with. Why should it remain in India? 
Stuti Goel asks, what are the exceptional circumstances where magistrate can order further investigation of a case? Uh, I think the power to grant further investigation is if the magistrate believes either some aspects of investigation have not been uh, looked at, which are crucial, because the investigation is an attempt to find out the truth about a crime. So that can be one of the circumstances. Or if the complainant can point out that material which is crucial has not been considered or picked up, or lines of investigation have not been done. So often a complainant will have a grievance. Sometimes the court will be concerned about the need to investigate. On other occasions, the court may believe that the investigation has reached four persons, but not beyond, gone beyond the four. In terms of Justice Nariman's latest decision, now this investigation, further investigation can be ordered into court to the consideration of charge and no further. So that's a very important limitation that's come on further investigation. Otherwise, as you know, further investigation used to go on endlessly. I've known of cases where it's gone on for more than 10 years and still continues to go on. And that's a little ridiculous. Uh, Ankis has posed a question, which statement of the witnesses should be recorded if he changes his statement? I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't understand what you mean by that. Ankit says, which statement of the witness should be recorded if he changes his statement many times? I, couldn't, I myself couldn't get it. Uh, you have either 161 or 164. If an investigator or officer has a doubt about the changing statements, the safest thing is to get it recorded before a magistrate. The accused will take advantage of the discrepancy in the different statements and different versions which he or she is entitled to. Ashima Gupta is asking a number of questions, so I better answer that because there are three, four yeah. messages he sent. Who just ask this? See what is the question? Uh, Ashima, sir, so do I read the question of Ashima? How to cross examine the road certificate memo? How to cross examine the uh, road certificate memo? Very important. The road certificate memo is the uh, is part of the chain of evidence. So you have to. Look at it from the perspective, I can't tell you the question because that will vary from case to case, but you'll have to look at it from the perspective of maker, the uh, time of making, the movement of that certificate, and also seek at that time, could it possibly have been made by the concerned officer? So the making of that certificate is challenged then the movement of that certificate will also have to be challenged and its arrival at its destination. So these are the three pieces. The whole idea to hit a road certificate memo is we will try and show that it's not made uh, at the time it was made and that it's been made later or that there's a very, or that the person who made it is not, the person whose signature is, made, has, uh, is on it has not made it. So these are the kind of discrepancies you have to uh, pick up on that because, and you will contrast this with the enters in register number 19, which is the Malkana register, and also the destination where the circuit is done. It's a lab. Pramesh Badi asks, uh, can the period for filing of the charge sheet be kept in abeyance? What the COVID-19 impact with respect of limitation? Can we get the default bail or not? I believe that default bail is an absolute right, and therefore, I it's, sorry, 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 and therefore I believe that default bail should be uh, granted if the investigation is not complete. You have no right to keep an accused in custody when you are not able to investigate, and therefore default bail is a matter of right. It is not a matter of. Privilege. Uh, so, could you explain the concept of blanket bail? Blanket bail. <coughs> I'm sorry, I am not very clear on the question. Blanket bail in the sense, as what has been granted to Arnab Goswami today, is that what you're asking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if a accused is not found during the investigation, the police harasses their family. What is the remedy? And they search their home without search warrants. What can be done to stop this? In the old days, what we used to do was we used to give telegrams to the High Court or to other places to create a record about these searches. 
and if necessary if you feel if there is a you can move the state human rights commission or the national human rights commission or file a writ petition in court you can even go and move an application before the magistrate to say that there is harassment being done and to monitor investigation that can also be sought in terms of uh, that uh, you know by judgment of justice nariman as also sakiri vas how to tackle the situation when the doctor who prepared the post mortem changes his slash her testimonials how to tackle a situation when the doctor who prepared the post mortem that's the same question you know uh, doctors who who prepare post mortems have to be tested on two parts one is on the record of uh, the actual carrying out of the post mortem we must keep in mind that normally post mortems that are done the bodies are unfortunately cut up not cut up not by the doctor but by possibly the sweeper or the attendant who's there that's a reality of life so you can question the doctor on the knowledge you can question him on the lack of video conferencing because that's one of the guidelines which have been issued that video conferencing should be done as a norm uh, a video recording should be done as a norm and thirdly you will have to question the doctor on his scientific knowledge i'll give you an example a few years ago there was a case which i had done in the trial court finally the high court has uh, upset the conviction and acquitted the person and rightfully so there was a case of a famous uh, journalist called suhail elyasi i don't know if you remember he used to do a show called india's most wanted he was tried under 302 uh, from 304 they made it 302 because many years later there was uh, there was shortly thereafter there was a medical board which was set up so we had to confront and cross examine i i had to confront and cross examine the doctor on his medical knowledge because he was an expert and he was heading that board of five eminent doctors so we did it in two ways the first thing we discuss, we worked out was that the other four members of the medical board were connected with this particular gentleman they were known to him they were either associated or personal so we allege a personal bias the second thing we did was we picked up literature on the subject and asked him first whether he agreed with the literature now literature was like modi standardized textbooks on medical jurisprudence which no doctor worth his salt no forensic doctor is going to deny after we picked it up and confronted him with parts of that we then we left it at that because our whole point was that do you agree with this passage of moti the moment he said yes we stopped short then we left it and put suggestions to him to say this is wrong this is wrong and this is wrong because our whole point was that he we had his examination in chief and then we had a quoted passage from modi which demolished his examination in chief and that is all we needed to do and that's what got him off and in a med- in a medical negligence case if the doctor is found guilty of his negligence does the court have the power to terminate his license or is it transferred to the medical council of india to do so no the power to cancel licenses of doctors just as it was of lawyers you remember the classic case of bc mishra uh, that lies with the concerned regulator even under the pndt act the court can give a recommendation the court can give a recommendation to the medical council to take action against a doctor who's been convicted or who's been charged but nothing more okay one little thing i want to tell somebody there was a very important question some you put was police a note came police does not give a receiving of documents i wanted to address that i'm sorry i seem to have missed that out you're right police don't given a, don't uh, record it the only way then to record the fact that documents have been supplied is twofold one to move to send a representation to a higher officer or to the same officer by a uh, letter registered postal letter not courier it is registered post is recorded sending or by email if you have the email address or alternatively move the magistrate's court to say we have given this and the officer is not acknowledging it most likely the court will call for a response and the fact of that document having been given to the officer will come on record and that's the whole purpose isn't it uh under which provision the magistrate has the power to send accused to judicial custody in case the 90 days period of section is over and chalan has not been submitted in the court if the person is not if a chalan has not been submitted 
the only possibility to remand is under 309 is under 309 once the investigation is over now the catch here is the moment chalan is not submitted you have a right to seek bail all you need to do is assert that right only and uh, and furnish bonds however in practice magistrates don't often if a person does not have a surety they say all right you don't have a surety but even the moving of a bail application getting the bail order is good enough you can furnish bonds later and then you will be kept in in custody pending the remand issue and that can only be because there are only two provisions 167 pending investigation and 309 later once the investigation period has lapsed is over thank you on getting default a uh, bail under section 1672 and after the presentation of chalan under section 173 can magistrate uh, does the magistrate have power to cancel the bail co moto no not so moto what is the just i'm uh, yeah go ahead go ahead i have not been able to find that provision which you asked about for conviction i don't think there's a provision in the statute but one can have a look in the ipc i believe there is only under 311a which is the question one of our young friends had put under 311a uh, where is it coming yeah Three eleven eight at the most, um, and there can be an adverse inference. But I I've not been able to find a provision for prosecution for a person who refuses. However, no, there is. I must I must clarify. Just a moment. There is there is my mistake. There is one provision, and that will be, and this will possibly get covered under one seventy four of the IPC. So please ask. Our friends to look at 174 of the IPC, non legally bound, non attendance, or uh, or uh, perhaps even uh, 178, 179, 180. These kind of provisions may be uh, invoked, but otherwise there is no specific provision as I recall. Uh. Can SDM decide the ownership of a MOA property? Can he recommend an FIR under Section 447 IPC? And SDM cannot determine ownership because an SDM only, while carrying out breach of lease proceedings, only looks at possession. The title of a property is to be determined in a civil court. So that's one part of the question. The other part was sorry. Uh, can he can he register an FIR? Well, he can be a first informant if necessary. or he can ask the police to take action but then the police is to determine whether it's a case to take action or not that's in their discretion he cannot insist on the police taking action that's their independent power what is the evidentiary value of extra judicial confession and when it can be admissible weak piece of evidence but can be admissible has been accepted extra judicial confessions uh, are accepted as valid piece of evidence but as i said a weak piece of evidence And normally you don't convict a person on extra judicial confession alone it needs corroboration corroboration can a conviction be imposed on the basis of sole deposition of interested witnesses if second question is if injury report discredited on uh, can conviction be imposed on the basis of oral evidence can a sorry come again can a conviction be imposed on the basis of oral evidence is your question yes if uh, injury report is discredited can conviction be imposed on the basis of oral evidence yes uh yes it can be done uh if you recall the navjot sandhu's case there was no real uh, you may want to see the supreme court judgment on that i leave it at that because it's under review and i'm preparing for the complainant navjot can the, <coughs> can the enforcement director attach property other than the proceeds of the crime yes the enforcement director can attach equivalence property also and they seem to be doing that all the time the property is not available so that is a problem now when they invoke black money they attack equivalence and that has been a issue of debate now it is legally permissible uh, will the new amendment to the pc act which has introduced sanction for investigation under section 17a have retrospective effect as it is a procedural amendment or will it apply to the cases filed after the amendment it will apply to cases after the amendment it's a red, it it may be 
Uh, I don't even think it is retroactive, but it will apply to cases registered after the amendment. Uh, we there is a there are challenges to this that it should apply to pending investigations. I must share with you uh, many years ago in the Delhi High Court in a case called P M Singh, we argued on the retroactivity of Section 60 of the DST Act, unsuccessful. Should preliminary investigation be made a rule before arrest, uh, as held by Supreme Court for Dori case and Arnesh case? I have a serious concern. I think it's not just preliminary inquiry or investigation. I think uh, the fact that we have our prisons over flooded by under trials is a serious problem in our system. And that will have to change. If nothing else, the COVID uh, epidemic is going to change that. And I hope it will because Arrest is not essential sometimes, and I've been a prosecutor, I must tell you this also, I haven't been a prosecutor. I find often that a person who's, out, who's at liberty is often more desirous of maintaining the liberty and evinces greater cooperation and arrest should be limited to either the most heinous of offenses or alternatively, arrest should be limited to cases where, uh, to cases where it is essential because of interference, uh, tampering, etc. If two accused are confronted each other by the investigating agency and video recording is made by the agency, what is the evidentiary value of the recorded evidence? Sorry, come again. So if two accused are confronted uh, each other by the investigating agencies and video recording is made by the agency, what is the evidentiary value of the recorded evidence? Nothing, sir. It's only a confrontation. It's only statements of an accused. Once you want, there's no value to this. Does police have right to collect forensic samples without having sufficient knowledge? The fact is that police police send them send these um, samples. Uh, sorry, do they have the right to collect without? Uh, yeah. They always have these crime teams and these crime teams are the ones who are supposed to investigate and to gather this material. Uh, if you see the Nirbhay case, it was done very effectively the way investigation gathered every bit of piece of evidence because they often watch up the collection of the evidence because they are either not equipped or adequately trained. That is the reason we have a lot of problems. Uh, as a prosecutor, I face this more often than not. And that is the reason a lot of accused get away because of the gaps in collection of the evidence. How authentically good is a dying declaration which is written in a question answer form? If again, it is permissible, there is no harm. There can also be an oral, there can be a, a dying declaration which is not uh, recorded, uh, uh, not in the person's uh, handwriting but can also be done through signals and indication that's been accepted in the nearby case. You may want to see that. Competence of the investigation officer is a big detriment in the process of justice. Should regular and mandatory trainings be made a part of police curriculum? I think it is very important that investing, look, I'll, I'll share some very interesting insight with you. Uh, I occasionally deal at, uh, interact uh, with people at police academies, uh, and I find a very fascinating thing. Police officers now want better training. They are looking because they are finding the nature of crime to be more and more complex. And also, technology has changed the way they operate and they investigate. The very simple issue is, for example, and this is happening again and again, there is a concept, as I said, called practical policing, where people are arrested at point A at 11 a.m. in the night, morning, whereas actually the arrest took place at 6 a.m. at point B. Now, the giveaway in such situations are the mobile phones of the investigating officers. The records in the daily, daily diary in the police station are no longer relevant because the electronic phone is an imprint of wherever you go and what you do. This is changing the way investigators investigate and therefore you will find that now a lot of them are looking for more regulation, more training because they are finding that the old uh, method of keeping daily diaries open till midnight and then again at 12 in the day when the shift changes is not going to work. 
and we also need to streamline the punjab police rules they were great for the time that they existed when our society was really a rural society in a society which is now more and more urbanized and there is technology we need to modernize and train our police officers which will the better trained they are hopefully arrest will be less likely and prosecutions will be limited to only cases which need to be prosecuted and challans will not be filed only because you want to play a numbers game now this is a very uh, important consideration and i hope that this change is going to be seen i have another question from mr nalva here which is can the trial court decide to forego procedure for hospital service once is decide to follow the ground of delay of trial without uh, segregation of trial fact i must tell you this according to me if there are a number of accused in the trial it ought not to be separated however because you have to first uh, proceed declare a certain bunch of accused proclaim offenders and then proceed against the others but this practice is gaining strength when courts are saying all right we are segregating the trial without going through the processes of the crpc whether it be 105 or whether we issue some an international warrant and this is a practical problem this should not be permissible nalva fortuitously comes from your chamber i am fortunate that i have had the privilege of working with mr nalva he is a fine young man and a dear friend no no he is also again a dear friend of mine how how we as a country can improve the scientific means of investigation vis a vis developed countries like america and australia infrastructure training and education we have to ensure that our police are given adequate in infrastructure in terms of technology in terms of vehicles in terms of mechanism to move today sos shos or sos have official mobile phones below that the sub inspectors don't have them but they need them all the time if you were to give them all mobile smartphones and enable them to record the testimonies there and then and record and give intimations regarding their movement and records you will ensure that there is a greater efficacy in investigations and they will not be wasting their time creating unnecessary records which are a uh, relics of a bygone era secondly we need officers without prejudices and biases now it's very difficult to reduce prejudices and biases but the fact is education and i'm not talking about literacy alone openness training needs to be changed thirdly what are the promotional avenues for a constable in england in the us a constable a person who joins as a basic detective can become the commissioner of the boss of police the commissioner in the particular state of the town of the in india a person who joins as a constable however educated or intelligent he may be will at the most make it a sub inspector not more two stars not even a third star so therefore we need to ensure that we get the best talent people who are engaged in the act of investigation must be given due, due recognition so that we have expertise which comes forth it's a large uh, change which will be needed from top to bottom it's not going to be easy but we need to give recognition we need to give uh, promotional avenues we need to uh, sensitize we need to upgrade infrastructure we need to upgrade training and have periodical trainings so our officers have the best of training and are able to do scientific and effective investigations which will then lead to fair and effective prosecutions and not just lame duck prosecutions where individuals suffer and are acquitted many years later so one question which is uh, just pouring in from various participants are as to how the uh, today's matter could have been listed directly in, in the annab's case the supreme court now is taking matters uh, on uh, because we have electronic filing is 24 hour 7 filing you can even file a document in the morning i am not representing mr goswami nor am i appearing against him but uh, i think article 14 should apply to everyone <laughs> <laughs> that's nice and sweet uh whether acquittal of an accused in the cbi leads to automatic acquittal in pmla proceedings as an 
existence of a scheduled offense is necessary as was done in 2G uh, spectrum case if so how are the pmla proceedings independent there is now an amendment to the pmla act to permit it to go on even if it fails uh, earlier the position used to be if the crime is gone where is the question of proceeds of crime or a prosecution for holding proceeds of crime now this aberration that has come in that now you can proceed with a prosecution under pmla even if the uh, parent offense is results in acquittal according to me is a no brainer it's very clear you don't have the parent offense you can't remember the disadvantage for an accused in a pmla prosecution is that he or she is made to sign statements which are full in evidence those are not the kind of statements which are taken in a police case or a cbi case so therefore the chances of conviction will exist the other fundamental concept of law is issue of stoppel if on the same material you have achieved an exoneration let's say even in an arms act case then the murder case for that weapon will not lie because that case may fall through so if the issues are common it's going to fail now this is a concept which has been recognized issue stopping the sham kejriwal's case and according to me the i am just holding you for a minute sapan you will have to uh, the person who is recording the entire this thing sapan you will have to check it at uh, your end uh, mr siddharth is quite audible we will have to we will have to relook at and challenge these amendments to the pmla which i believe are already pending because according to me they are not uh constitutionally valid so next question is sumit so jain asked if mobile location and call record is defense for accused how accused can preserve that evidence during the investigation mobile location and call records are preserved for a year the moment you are arrested or the mo moment you are put to a prosecution or investigation you must either write to the investigator to do it or move the court for a direct magistrate court of the trying trial court for a direction that this record be preserved otherwise it is lost after a year and then you don't have your defense so one thing i must confess uh, to the entire participants that since the questions are just barging and barging few questions would be missed in that entire show uh, then there was a question on conviction on the basis of sole deposition of an interested witnesses you asked that question i'm sorry i missed that out ah uh, the fact that a witness is an interested witness should have been a ground to oust their testimony but that test of the witness being interested has been diluted further so even if it's interested if it's otherwise acceptable courts are convicting on it i will leave you to make your own determination but i think that position needs revisiting uh munish behel asked documents collected by the investigating agencies during the course of investigations have not been supplied to the accused on the ground that those documents are not relied by the prosecution whether it is violative of fair trial nityanand is the answer please look up nityanand i just said justice goel's judgment i had appeared as uh, a micus in that justice goel and lalit it's a very useful judgment your answer will lie with that it is violative of fair trial in terms of the decision in uh, shashi kala and it, this is even mentioned in uh, uh manu sharma's case but that doesn't serve your purpose your purpose will be served by nityanand where you can get copies of the various high courts have taken the bill or supreme court also accepted that uh, abhimanyu has time and again posted somehow i missed it my apologies can an fir be quashed on the grounds of territorial jurisdiction of the police station where it has been registered the police complaint does not disclose that the cause of action has accrued where fir has been registered the answer is in the negative please look at satinder kaur i think it's 99 supreme court and please also look at lalita kumari it can be treated as in zero fir and transferred to the appropriate jurisdiction how can the chain of custody of evidence be proved or disproved whether it is forensic or otherwise good question the chain of custody begins from the point of seizure for retention by the police officer deposit in the malkhana movement of the malkhana through the uh, using road certificates and through constables who carry it and deliver it to the lab or to the appropriate place where it is to be tested or kept that entire chain has to be seen segment by segment and all the relevant witnesses and their contradictions has to be examined analyzed to see 
Do we have interstate contradictions on timing, place, location? Do we have interstate contradictions in the documents? Are the contradictions in the time of receipt in the Malkana and the IO statement? So that's where you'll have to take advantage. And if there are other discrepancies in the documents or that the articles are not properly sealed or there's a discrepancy in, this, uh, in the description of the seal or that the seals are floating around as they're actually, in reality, seals just floating around in the police station, they're multiple seals. All these are ground which will have to be seen. But again, the answer is only this. The difference between a trial and an SLP is that in a trial, you must look at the, have a global picture of your facts. And as my late father used to tell me and taught me in the brief time that I had with him, the moment your alarm comes, do your research for your trial, have your case law on, see the precedents, prepare your defense based on the judgments you would be citing at the ultimate conclusion. That will give you most likely your line of cross-examination, that will give you your line of defense and your line of preparation for the final arguments as well. You will evolve this as this goes around, but start then. Most of us, when we get the chalan, we look at it, all right, now it's time to argue charge. Now charge is done. Now it's time to do trial. That's not the way to do it. Prepare as if you are now, charge is framed and you're going to have to start the trial tomorrow and that's how you'll excel. That was a good piece of advice. I, I suppose everybody will take it well. Sapan, Sapan and Samna want to ask me on my thoughts on the death penalty and it's important. Sapan, I've appeared in the Nirbhay case and argued for the death penalty. Don't ask me that one. <laughs> uh, we evolved in the principle there on uh, society's cry of justice is now accepted as a parameter for the death penalty. So I'm not going to mention that. I'm not going to go down that path. As a complainant, what remedy do we have to seek a custody of an accused in a financial fraud if the investigation agency has not sought to arrest him during the investigation and has filed a chalan? Can court seek his custody? Uh, two answers. The role of a victim in a criminal case is now being determined by a judgment called Rekha Murarka. It was, uh, it explains what is the role of a victim in a criminal prosecution. You may want to see that. Originally, the judgment said it was dismissed. Later on, it was qualified that it was disposed of because certain directions have been given. So that's part one. Part two, you can, if the police are not acting or not, or not conducting themselves fairly, you can move the trial court under Sakiri Vasu. I believe it is para 17, uh, 16 or 17. You can check that out yourself, which allows the, you to ask the trial court magistrate to monitor the investigation. And during monitoring, you can, the reports will have to be filed and the police will have to justify their investigation to the magistrates. That's a part that rests with the magistrate. And one of the well poses a question, how magistrate can take any action against the IO? If he's not taking any action against the accused by using his power of superintendence. Ah, that's the, that's an important question. I think the magistrate can monitor the investigation. I, the magistrate can direct the man, direct the areas to be investigated as in if some things are left out in further investigation, but the magistrate can't fixate the IO whether to arrest or not to arrest. That is not the power of the magistrate. The magistrate cannot insist. Uh, because the, if you remember that old classical decision of Khwaja and Nazir Ahmed, where it said the power of the police and the power of the court are distinct. That is the principle in MC Abraham. No court can direct arrest. You can issue a warrant on the request of the investigating officer to arrest a person, but you can't direct arrest or direct uh, a certain line of action to be taken against him. How many prosecutors in the court record examination in chief line by line from the statement under section 161 CRPC? Even after objecting, the court seems to have taken it very casually. What is the way out as it completely destroys our opportunity for contradiction? We do not have video recording of such proceedings. Well, in the VC era, things are going to change. So don't worry. That's the first answer. In the video conferencing era, as we seem to be heading into it, uh, on a more practical and a more pragmatic point of view, 
I would say that there is uh, always a limitation with the practitioner who is exclusively practicing in the trial court because he has to deal with those particular judges and prosecutors on a daily basis. So while legally you have to take cudgels against such injustice, there are practical problems. And one of the way to obviate is, is to move an application. My late father used to tell me that if a judge doesn't record your objection, please move an application with the mentioning the question asked or the objection raised and the fact that it may be taken on record. Even if the judge doesn't uh, take, doesn't uh, record it, the fact of that application being on record may be of some benefit. And that is the mechanism by which you can record your objections to such a course of conduct. Mm. Is the police bound to arrest an accused after the Supreme Court refuses to grant anticipatory bail? The answer is MC Abraham 2003. The answer is no, it's not necessary. The discretion lies with the police, but the answer, as I said, is the judgment has already settled the position. Thank you very much. Can magistrate change the investigating officer while ordering further investigation under Section 173? The magistrate can always say that this should be investigated or considered by an officer of a high rank, but no, he can't change the officer. That discretion lies with the police, not with the magistrate. It has been reported by few newspapers. This is a question also and answer also. It has been reported by few newspapers that the police is conducting investigation in case of sensitive matters and some serving summons to the witnesses. Can such summons be served during COVID-19 lockdown? Look, uh, nothing has stopped. Investigations have not stopped. It's not that the police have been stopped from functioning. Legally, there is no bar. Provided they are otherwise compliant, but you have a logical defense to say, we can't appear because of COVID-19 lockdown. Now, if that is the case, then either you will move the police, because after all, the passes are to be issued by the police officers only. If they want to really call you, they can always get passes issued for a person to join investigation if necessary. But on health grounds or on age grounds or on infirmity grounds, you can avoid it at this stage. You can make a request at this stage, which is a legitimate request. If the police insist on doing this, please approach the courts. These are urgent matters. They should be entertained. As you said, if Arnab could be entertained, why not this? Can a magistrate dismiss the surrender and bail application moved in a bailable offense? by the accused, even if he has not been declared PO. Abhorrent to the law, does happen, should not happen. You have a right of bail. There is no question of surrender. You have a right to be released on bail in a bailable offense. There is, you are appearing, you're not surrendering because surrender you will if you don't have, if it's an, it's surrender is a, a different connotation where you are, when you want to go to, when you're saying I'm willing to go to custody unless you give me bail. This is not a question of going to custody. The only circumstances by which this can happen is you will find that in section 42 of the CIRPC. Aman Manes asked, what is the effect of conducting inquiries by senior police officials during the pending investigations? This is, this is a common Punjab practice. Uh, it's been found to be a little questionable at times because these lead to aberrations and Confusion. It's a Punjab practice is also UP practice. During an investigation, uh, it is the investigator's sole domain to look into a matter. Yes, if the, a senior officer is to look at it, let the investigation be transferred. Under Section 36, senior officers can investigate. Sometimes there are vigilance inquiries into the conduct of the police officers who are investigating. That can be done, but otherwise you can't have parallel inquiries going on when an investigation is on. I think that's abhorrent to the law. Can criminal trials be expedited with the use of technology? Could you suggest few things that could be done to expedite the criminal trials with the use of these technologies? I think expediting criminal trials is only one part of the picture. I'm looking for fairer criminal trials, for more efficacious criminal trials. For criminal trials which are less, was less hardship to all the players in the criminal justice system. You see, uh, I have recently done a case which uh, 
It's called Anokhi Lal. I don't know if you read about it. It's a very interesting case. It's a, it was a criminal trial in the state of Madhya Pradesh where the trial was concluded within 13 days. 13 days death penalty. The, penalty, the conviction was struck down because of the manner it was done. I had the privilege of citing an old judgment which my father had argued way back in 1969. And the conviction has been set aside. The sentence has been set aside. The matter has been remanded for retrial. So speed is not necessarily a very good thing. It doesn't help matters. Having said that, once trial begins, we must follow what the Kerala model, which is compliance with Section 309. It must go on day to day and must be concluded. My belief is that if we have trials by video conferencing, which is, seems to be most likely now, you will then have dedicated times for trials. And then courts can actually fix trials maybe six months or a year from now, but then do it day to day. Because at that time, you will not have the hassle of witnesses not being available because people will be available for video conferencing. You won't have the problem with experts coming in from labs. You won't have problems of investigating officers being busy maybe once, but not permanently. So all those mechanisms can be resolved, provided we have secure locations for recording of evidence at the place where the witness is present so that there is no interference in the witness's testimony. But that's the way forward, I would believe. So just taking a cue from your observations, it's always said that justice delayed is justice denied and justice hurried is justice buried also. Yes, indeed. Read that gentleman, Anoki Lal. It's the order sheet of that case was very disturbing. Very disturbing. And I was doing it uh, pro bono. It was for the Legal Aid Authority. And I, I must say it was a privilege to do it as assist the court as a micus. We are now looking at guidelines as to how these trials have to go. Or because under the CRPC, there's been an amendment to 309. So certain class of trials have to be done within two months. But practically, with the way our system moves, they will not be done. So we are trying to, the court is trying to evolve a mechanism as to how these trials can be. Even if there's a breach of the two-month mandate, how do you preserve expedition and yet maintain, protect the rights of the accused and the victims as well? Talking about special, uh, specialized enforcement agencies, does CBI have power to investigate a state government employee, CEO Moto, without any court order or without any sanction to do so by the state government? Only if uh, there is a generalized permission, yes, otherwise no. Uh, in union territories, they can do it because there is an old judgment called E.C. Sharma, which permits them to do the union territories, not within the states. The federal principle prohibits them from investigating without consent of the state government. Whether accused is, uh, when the accused is aggrieved by the report of medical expert, can he prefer an appeal against it? Sorry, come again? I'm just coming. When the accused is aggrieved of the report of medical expert, can he prefer an appeal against it? I think that will have to be tested during the proceeding of the trial. You can't challenge a report alone. That will have to be tested in cross-examination. Of course, the accused can always request the court to say that there should be a medical board constituted. That can possibly be. Can a conviction on the basis of a sole deposition of an interested witness? I'd answer this. Hello? I'd answered this earlier. Okay. Can an accused be sent to judicial custody? That is also there. Are the penal provisions in the new Benami law retrospectively applicable? And can Ben Amidar retract from the confessional statement which he gave during to the IO during the appeal in the appellate tribunal? If he can, then is it any good for the case of the beneficial power? Beneficial owner, I stand corrected. That's uh, four questions rolled into one. Are they retrospective? I be, I, as I recall, I believe they are sought to be made retrospective, though there is a challenge possibly pending to that. The second is the statements are recorded under the Benami Act. By a specialized agency, those will be acceptable and visible, as I recall. But uh, I don't want to give a very specific, detailed answer because I don't have the benefit of the act before me right now. 
what is the relevance of a disclosure statement of a co accused a disclosure statement of the co accused has no value sir it is uh, if you uh, it has no value it is only relevant for the purpose of investigation otherwise it is no value uh, the even a confession of the accused has no value you may want to look at these old judgments hari charan kurmi 1964 supreme court 1184 uh suresh budarmal kalani 98 and now the latest supreme court decision in surinder kumar khanna 2018 8 scc 271 so it's uh, 720 as we had asked that we will wrap up the session at uh, 730 just a short 5 minutes what, how to become a good lawyer it's a normal format we ask all senior advocates how to become a good lawyer because many of us Uh, in this platform are young lawyers and some are students what is to be done how research has to be done and how to move ahead how to make a mark with this society vikas you are assuming i'm old that's no right. there are only, uh, like to everybody says there are only two stage young and very young and i will put you in the category of very young that's very gracious of you then i will answer your question yeah okay i'll uh, there are a few mantras which i must tell you the first is dedication and hard work focus shakespeare said that to succeed in anything you have to have the very devil inside you that is one of my late father's favorite quotes he used to tell me i also believe that we are living right now in an age not in the information age alone but in a not in the knowledge age but we are living in an era of information explosion where we are being bombarded by information and all of it is not necessarily desirable from the point of view of ensuring clarity of thought why do i say this because today you have hundreds of precedents coming every day from different high courts you have precedents coming from the supreme court the scc the a the supreme court judgments used to be at the most one volume now you have 16 17 volumes of supreme court judgments and often self contradictory so preparation diligence an understanding of the law is crucial secondly know your file backwards spend time on your file don't have a cursory look there must be depth of understanding shut yourself off from the world when you're preparing matters this constant access to social media or constant access of social media to an individual is never good whenever i have to do final hearings i often do this on a saturday or or on a sunday when i'm sitting alone in my office perhaps with one junior put away my phones and then just spend a few hours and sometimes don't even get up i have lunch on my table because i don't want to break my line of concentration sometimes i even sit out you know that's the only way to get final hearings prepared the third thing is understanding of the law understanding of the facts preparation and is very good analysis is very important because in your mind you must break up your cases whether for trial cross examination or final arguments into segments which are going to be neat segments with the ability to switch around and deal with other aspects depending on the query that's going to come from the judge so you must also anticipate the query that comes from courts and lastly and the most important are we giving ourselves times for contemplation are we giving us me time are we giving us non law time if you don't if individuals professionals today don't crowd their calendar with more commitments than a 24 day can handle they will be according to me much deeper professionals the era of past professionals lawyers doctors used to be that they would work for a set time and they would have their off time whether they were reading whether they were listen to music whether they were just walking in the garden whether they were exercising but a lot of ideas speaking for myself come to me when i'm out in the morning walk or in the evening walk or when i'm even just riffling through a novel or let's say some history book 
So I think it's very important from lawyers to have a larger vision beyond the law. It makes for a richer personality. It makes for a greater ability to understand because especially if you're dealing with criminal law, what is criminal law? Criminal law is the study of human nature. How people interact with each other. Why do murders take place? Why do certain offenses take place? It's the interaction of humans, the angst of humans, the desires of some, the problems of others, the limitations of some. All of these are what criminal law is about because criminal law is the study of human life. That being the position, my recommendation to my young friends is seep yourself in your files, seep yourself in the law, but part of yourself must be kept away from the law. Where not just family time, but also time to disconnect. It's difficult for young professionals, but it's important. And lastly, watch good lawyers. And when I mean good lawyers, not just the top-notch successful lawyers, but watch the deep lawyers who may be a rung below, but who have some or all the qualities that I've just mentioned. See them, observe them in court, interact with them, learn from them. A lot of what, what is contained in the statute books, in the textbooks, is knowledge which we can obtain. But legal sanskar, legal values, will come by learning from people who are more senior to us, or people sometimes even more junior to us, who will teach us value systems and an understanding and a work culture. That's my recommendation. So last point, what you have said, probably large number of people have observed today itself. Some percentage definitely has been saved in. And the points which you have t told to us, now I can understand why my friend Nalva is so polished because he has worked under your tutelage and he's shining like anything in, in our high court. He's a yes. brand within himself. I'm sorry, I will not unmute him because that's the uh, procedure in our proceedings. He's and sir, I will ask yes. Shruti ma'am. I will ask Shruti ma'am, uh, who has... Uh, co-edited books along with you that is judicial review and taking bail seriously she has been a co-link she's a, though she's a been in ULS we pa passed out much earlier we haven't been able to study from her but be that as it may she became an important link between all the relationships which we have built in the relationship I will ask Shruti ma'am to just propose a vote of thanks on behalf of us and it's a wonderful session sir and we would like to say that uh, on the screen and off the screen I will take a request that you will just have to come again on this uh, platform it's an enriching and i will share with uh, my personal experience like for last two weeks we are going for these we webinars in the morning the sessions were always overcrowded and the evening <laughs> the graph was low but today the what audience and participants we have today it has broken all records i must say just like the gold prize which is soaring like anything your presence today has created all all the benchmarks for uh, this uh, beyond law a platform. Over to Shruti ma'am. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vikas Chatrat. And uh, just to say that uh, Siddharth sir, he's put us both in the category of old people because he says that I haven't studied from you. But anyway, coming to my current job, uh, which is to propose the vote of thanks. And uh, I would just like to say that uh, wisdom and intellect are displayed through boldness. That is one of the ways. And you claim that this boldness today is a deliberate act of yours. However, both today, both your speech and your looks have displayed a brilliant exposition of the subject of criminal investigation. Though it is not my area of expertise, I'm still a student of uh, law where I'm picking up uh, bits and pieces from here and there. But judging from the barrage of questions which uh, Mr. Vikas Chatter has been subjected to, he, it's a volley of balls uh, which he's grappling to hold and throw your way. We can judge the uh, from this response. You can judge that how well you have discussed and uh, you know discussed the fundamentals of this subject, a very important subject for both lawyers and for law students, a lot of them being here today. 
and therefore on behalf of all the participants and on behalf of the team beyond law clc i deeply express my gratitude to you uh, for being here and for discussing and for being a part of this session uh, i would like to uh, share with everyone here that uh, mr siddharth luthra's father mr kk luthra was an eminent criminal lawyer and has made a landmark contribution in the field of criminal law and his son takes after him so i think he you are following his footsteps making him feel proud and that's something to be really grateful for uh mr vikas chakra talked about uh, the book that we have co-edited in fact one of the books taking bail seriously is dedicated to mr siddharth luthra's father mr kk luthra uh, we never had the privilege of meeting him but we have his son before us uh, the doyen of criminal law if i may say so so thank you so much sir for your presence and for your words and we hope that we can impinge on your time at a future date again because judging by this uh, response i'm sure they are waiting to hear a lot from you again and uh, mr vikas chakra uh, was talking to you about the questions but there were a lot of comments appreciating and congratulating you on this lecture so i wish you the very best sir and thank you so much again for being a part of this thank you thank you so thank you for this opportunity so th thank you and uh, just for all the participants tomorrow we have a session by mr amal lekhi the additional solicitor general on traversing uh, judicial review under article 226 you can join us on the facebook uh, instagram and the whatsapp group to the effect to know about the sessions we are taking on what uh, beyond law so thank you it was a wonderful session we would love to catch you up again i don't know whether you enjoyed this session if you have enjoyed then we take the promise that you have to come on this platform again i had a great time it was uh, the quest the volume of questions was very fascinating in a whole range uh, thank you so much it's been a great interactive session and i'm grateful for the opportunity vikas uh, dr bedi always a pleasure interacting with you thank you so much. thank you sir thank you so th thank you thank you